I'm looking at 1 Corinthians. Now, 1 Corinthians, the author is the Apostle Paul. It's got 16 chapters, 437 verses, and around 9,489 words. The writing is around 59 A.D. The word Corinthians means ornaments. And what you have in the book of Corinthians is a book of what not to do. Because this is known as the carnal church made up of babes in Christ, baby Christians, very carnally acting Christians. Then the three applications for Corinthians is historically Paul is going to address the worldly ways of the church at Corinth. Devotionally, you should examine yourself as you read 1 Corinthians to avoid being a worldly Christian. Doctrinally, this is the epistle of correction. So that's your three applications. In Corinthians, the Bible hasn't been complete yet when Paul's writing Corinthians. The Bible's not complete yet. So sign gifts are still present. Many unbelieving Jews are still present. And it's things are still at the end of that transition from uh, Jew to Gentile. So you're going to see the sign gifts show up. And Corinthians, it is a seaport in Greece, so they had a temple there for Aphrodite, the goddess of lust, and since it's a seaport in Greece, that's another reason tongues are present. The Corinthians is mentioned in Acts 16, 17, and 18, and it's established on Paul's, the church of Corinth is established on Paul's Second journey, second missionary journey. Now here's your quick little outline. Chapter 1, the Corinthians have divisions. Chapter 2, worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. Chapter 3, you got the judgment seat of Christ. And the Corinthians have been arguing over who won them to Christ. Chapter 4, you have the job of every Christian is to teach the mysteries. Chapter 5, Corinthians have trouble with fornication. Chapter 6, they go to law one with another and Paul shows them proper Christian judgment. Chapter 7, you got Christian rules on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Chapter 8, you got meat offered to idols. Chapter 9, you got liberty as a Christian. Chapter 10 pulls the Old Testament and New Testament together. Gives you, tells you about Old Testament examples. 11, you got head coverings and the Lord's Supper. Chapter 12, you got spiritual gifts, one body with many members. Chapter 13, you got charity, 14, rules for tongues, 15, the gospel, the resurrection, and resurrection body. 16, it discusses the collection for the saints, Paul's travel plans, and final instructions. So there's your quick outline. Now let's just dive in the book and look at it. See what we can see. Chapter 1. Okay, in chapter 1, who is the Corinthians written to? Look at chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 
So he's, he said to all that in every place. So I've, I've had people tell me that Corinthians is not written to everybody. It was just to the Corinthians and that was it. So when you get over there to the rules on tongues and ch chapter 14 and things like that, they'll say, well, that was just, they say, well, that was just to the Corinthians church because they were so carnal. This is the carnal church and Paul had to put all these rules on them. No, it says to all that in every place, call upon the name of the Lord. So who is the Corinthians written to? Well, he wrote it unto the church, which is at Corinth. But then he said to all that in every place. Now, the Corinthians, they got a big division problem. So when you get down to chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There's a lot of divisions between them. And then you get down in verse 14, he says, well, you see, the reason, one of the things that there's divisions about is because they're arguing about who baptized them. They think they're special because this certain uh, preacher baptized them. This guy thinks he's special because this certain person baptized him. And if you get down to verse 12, chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos. And I of Cephas, and I of Christ. <clears throat> See, they're they're trying to say, well, I'm under this guy, and this guy's saying, well, I'm under this guy. It's just like people today, like you got people that uh, their guy is Peter Ruckman, and then this other guy, his guy is James Knox, and then this other guy, his guy is Stephen Anderson. And so you got all these different little camps. Everybody's very campy. And they think that they're more spiritual because of the person they follow. But they don't realize that's actually very carnal. It's a very carnal thing. So they're like, I'm of Paul. I of Apollos. I of Cephas. And Cephas is Peter. Apollos is that guy from Acts that Aquila and Priscilla, they corrected his doctrine. And then you got the guy that says, an eye of Christ. You got the real spiritual one that says, well, I don't have a teacher. I just go by the Bible. I don't even need a teacher. The Holy Spirit guides me. You see, you got that guy too. But then Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius. You see, he didn't want these little fanboys. So he's glad that he didn't baptize any of them. That way they couldn't go around saying, well, I, I'm under Paul. They couldn't go around saying that. Lest, he says in verse 15, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. Now you think about this too. Paul here, he's giving you a balanced view on baptism. He said, I thank God in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. Now, if water baptism saved like most people say it do, then why is he glad that he didn't, hadn't baptized none of them? And you remember, he, he had, he's told the Corinthians that he's begotten them through the gospel. But he's not baptized any of them except for Crispus and Gaius. And then says, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name, Verse 16, and I baptize also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. Now look what he says, verse 17. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You see, he says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, showing you water baptism isn't even part of the gospel. And Paul's not even putting that big of an emphasis on getting water baptized. So, Church of Christ, those people that really push water baptism for salvation, what do you do with those verses there? Now look at verse 27 through 31. 
And you're going to see how God uses the weak things, the little things. And uh, verse 27, it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You see, the weaker something is, the more look down on, like if you look down on physically, you look down on mentally, you're the type of person that God can really use because if you um, get in the Bible and allow the Holy Spirit to lead your life, then when people look at you, whatever you're doing for the Lord, they're going to look at you and they're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not just going to be looking at your talent, how beautiful you are, how strong you are, and all this stuff. You see, the more a person's talent and abilities, the better they are, the more they're going to get the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you take a you take a great preacher, the gr many times the greater he is, and the more animated and charismatic he is, he's putting less attention on the Lord Jesus Christ and more attention on himself. That's just the truth. God uses the weak things of the world. And, I mean, you just think about it. You think about uh, uh, maybe a, a certain preacher. You get, all, you get a lot, uh, like, there's some preachers you go here and you're like, wow, the Bible is an amazing book. Then you go hear this other preacher and you're like, Wow, what an amazing preacher. You see the difference there? One of them left you saying, wow, the Bible's an amazing book. One of them left you saying, man, that was a great preacher. That's the best preacher I've ever heard. One of them gives God, gets God more glory. They both may be sincere. Both may be saying the exact same things. But God is able to get more from using a weak person because that weak person, he's got not nothing to offer and he's giving you the Bible and he's getting you impressed with the Bible and he's not very impressive himself. So he's not much to look at. So God's getting the glory. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. See, you're just looking at a guy in the flesh. You shouldn't glory in men. All the glory should go to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's who should be getting the glory because he's the wisdom. He's the righteousness. He's the sanctification and redemption. But, and look what it says, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. God likes using the weak things of the world because then he's more likely to get the glory. Now, chapter 2. You're going to see Paul doesn't use good words and fair speeches. He says in uh, verse 1, And I, brethren, even when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, he wasn't coming with excellency of speech. He wasn't coming with enticing words. You know, Paul, Paul talks about gods who use good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. He wasn't doing any of that. He was just coming to them, a regular old guy. Sure, he did have education. He was a smart guy, but... People aren't impressed by that. People aren't impressed by how much you know. They're impressed by how much you care. And people aren't going to understand anything that you're talking about when you start getting fancy and saying all these big words. And for, 
for the most part, the average person, you start getting up and talking about all these Greek words and all this stuff, you're just losing them. I mean, they, you lose me. When you get up and start talking uh, in the Greeks, this, so this means this. Just get the Bible. We got the Bible in English. Most of it's one syllable. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. See, most of it's one or two syllables. It's very simple stuff. The Bible is what's got the power in it. Just just give the Bible. Don't try to be uh, having enticing words, an excellency of speech and all that. Paul didn't do that. You get over in verse uh, 9. It says, but I, he says, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So you can't even fathom it. You can't even fathom what God has prepared for those that love him. And look at verse 10. He says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is even in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's how you learn. You compare spiritual things with spiritual. You compare the Bible with the Bible, and that's how the Holy Ghost teaches you. And he says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, the, you talk to a lost person about the Bible, you're just going to lose them most times, because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You talk to a carnal Christian about the Bible, a lot of times you're going to lose them, because... They're, they're so into the flesh, into the natural man. They can't even think spiritually. But then you get in chapter 3, and you're going to see just how bad, carnal, and fleshly the Corinthians are. Look at chapter 3, 1. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So this is your carnal church. They're babes in Christ. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. It's like a lot of Christians. They're not able to bear strong meat of the Bible. You got to give them milk over and over and over again. And then if you don't never wean them off the milk, they'll never get on no meat. Now, if, if your pastor's only giving you milk, then you got to get yourself off the milk and onto the meat. He says, For ye are yet carnal, in verse 3. For as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? They go around envying each other, thinking they ought to be having what the other guy has, whether it be their job or their talent or their, their car or whatnot, and strife. Always fighting, arguing, bickering with each other, and divisions. Seems like they got a lot of divisions, especially about who they follow. So, they need to learn to give God the glory and not the preachers so much, you see. In verse 4, look what it says. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Now, that's kind of dumb and carnal to go around saying, well, I sit under this guy. This is who I learn from. And he's, and you just and you have this superiority complex about you because you are under that guy. Look at what Paul says. He says in verse 4, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, 
even as the Lord gave to every man. You see, they're just ministers to whom you believe, by whom you believed. They're just ministers who uh, gave you the gospel, taught you something about it. He says in verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So you see, you may be going around planting. This other guy over here is watering. It's God that gives the increase. It all should be God in the forefront of everything. So you need to give God the glory, not preachers. It's causing you to have divisions, envy, and strife just like the Corinthians. And then he said, everyone shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So Paul gets into the judgment seat of Christ here. He says, for, for we are laborers together with God, in verse 9. We are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So you got your foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So you got gold. Gold uh, represents deity. So learn everything you can about God. That'll help you at the judgment seat of Christ. You got silver. Silver's the price of redemption. Learn what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. Then you got precious stones. Tell others about it to get you some precious stones. So you're going you're building you got your foundation the Lord Jesus Christ you're going to build your building with gold silver and precious stones hopefully and that's what's going to make it through the fire you're going to present that building to the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ he's going to put it through the fire and whatever makes it out on the other side is what you get if you build with wood hay and stubble it ain't going to make it he says in verse 14 if any man's work abide if it makes it through, you see, which he hath built their own, he shall receive a reward. But then look what he says in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, see, you build with wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to get burned up. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. See, you're, it's not you that's going to burn up. It's your works that are burning up. You make it. Because you're saved, you're born again, nothing can change that. But you just won't have a reward. And you see, that proves that not every Christian is going to just be this great spiritual giant, may not even show a change, may not ever do anything for the Lord. Because if, if everybody just started doing something for the Lord after they got saved and started really acting like a Christian ought to act, everybody would be racking up at the judgment seat of Christ, but they don't. So he says in verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? You see, we're not dwell uh, the Lord ain't dwelling in temple made with hands now. He's dwelling in you. And you're taking him everywhere you go. And he says in verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, chapter 4, it's going to talk about being a faithful steward. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Let a, man, let a man so count of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, you think about Paul, our example. He is a 
a faithful steward of the mysteries. He's the one that gave us the mysteries, that revealed all that to us. So he's your example on this. And then it, later on in this chapter and down in verse 11, he has to give the Corinthians his credentials not to puff himself up or make him look really good, but it's but they're so impressed with a certain men and getting drawn away by certain men. So Paul has to give them his credentials to remind them, you know, hey, I'm I'm the one that led you to the Lord and I'm the one trying to teach you right. Listen to me. So he gives them his credentials. Look at verse 11. He says, even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. He says, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So you see, he's telling them how hard he works, how hard it is for them, what he's going through, and then reminds them, you may have all these teachers that you look up to, but remember, I'm the one that led you to the Lord, and he tells them to be followers of him. A lot of people they follow probably aren't very good. Now, chapter 5, you got, it shows you how this carnal church, the Corinthians, this worldly church, they got a real big problem in the church with sexual sin, with fornication. And the fornication wasn't being dealt with in the church. They were going around acting like it wasn't happening, acting like everything was okay. So Paul says in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So you see, this man, he's, he's committing fornication with his father's wife. And look what he says about the Corinthians. He says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. See, they were so puffed up, thinking they that they are doing everything so right, that they're not seeing that they need to fix this problem, fix this situation. They're just allowing it to just keep happening. You know, if the problem's never dealt with, it's just going to keep going and going. And they need to judge themselves instead of just thinking that they got everything figured out. But you look down at verse 5, and Paul talks about how he's going to deliver such an one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see, he's talking about delivering this guy that's in this fornication, delivering him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You see, you're not going to lose your salvation by, by sinning and living wrong, but you can be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. If you live for the flesh, you'll die. You know, Ecclesiastes talks about how you can die before your time. You know, perhaps God, if you get right with the Lord, God continue to use you and you can get reward, more rewards for the judgment seat of Christ. Now look at 9 through 10. Chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. He says, I wrote unto you an epistle, and in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now that would be an epistle that we don't have. And that shows you that there's stuff that Paul wrote that didn't get put in the Bible. Doesn't mean it's lost. We got everything that God wanted us to have. But that shows you Paul did more writing than you even thought he did. He says, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For this for then must you need to go out of the world. You see, you're not supposed to company with fornicators, you know, being uh, just bros and big-time buddies and doing everything together. Now, that doesn't mean that you 
can't be in the same room with them. It doesn't mean you can't be friendly to them. It doesn't mean you can't witness to them. It doesn't mean you can't sit next to them in the break room or in a restaurant or whatever else. Because then, if you couldn't do any of that stuff, then must you need to go out of the world. You can't be so overly separated that you just have to stay in your house. He said, so he says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. You see, you're going to have to work with people like that, side by side. That doesn't mean that you're keeping their company. Now, you know the difference. You just got to use a little common sense. You know, I have to work with people that are druggies, fornicators, constantly saying filthy stuff. You know, I, you have to work with people. But you don't have to go, when they ask you, hey, let's go hang out tonight after work and go to places you shouldn't go. That's where you draw the line. Then you get over to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, you got proper Christian judgment. Chapter 6, he says, Dare any of you, in verse 1, Dare even any of you having a matter against another, Go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. See, they were taking their problems to, to lost people for them to judge them. He says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world should be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? You see, at the, at the great white throne judgment, we're going to be judging angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. You know, if you got a problem, you got something that needs to be fixed or resolved, do it amongst yourselves. He says, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. You know, is there not a guy out of all of y'all that could Come to a decision about these things that you got that need to be, uh, a judgment call needs to be made on. He says, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. So they were taking their problems before unbelievers to get, uh, to, for them to make a judgment call, and it was hurting their testimony. It was hurting their witness. He says, now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. You know, the lost world seeing how the, these carnal Christians were treating each other. That's a horrible testimony. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now you see that? He didn't say that they, that you wouldn't go to heaven. He says you're not going to have an inheritance in the kingdom. Now salvation is not inheritance. And so you, if you go through your Christian life as a fornicator, an adulterer, doing these things, you're cheating yourself out of an inheritance. If you there was if there was a time that you got born again that you believed on Jesus Christ, you're saved and you're going to go to be with the Lord for eternity. But you're cheating yourself out of inheritance in the kingdom. And notice it says it's it's saying like fornicators. It's not it doesn't say fornication. It says fornicators. It says idolaters, adulterers. If you're saved, even if you're committing the sin of fornication, in the eyes of God, you're not a fornicator. In the eyes of God, you're not an idolater. Because when he's looking at you in terms of salvation, he's seeing the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ on your record because that, uh, of that imputed righteousness that we talked about in Romans 4. And look what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When it comes to salvation, you're washed, you're sanctified. When he sees you, he sees the blood because he sees you washed in the blood. 
Now, so your con your your conduct affects your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, big time. You know, some people say, you know, you you don't think you can lose your salvation, so what's keeping you living right? Well, Paul says the love of Christ constraineth us. Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ. That's what keeps you living right. You don't want to get to the judgment seat of Christ and, and not get any rewards. But you look over at chapter 7. Now you get in chapter 7 and you got the greatest chapter in the Bible for Christian rules on marriage. And look at 7 and verse 2. It says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So to avoid fornication, the best thing to do is get married. So you're having a problem with fornication, you need to get your heart right with the Lord as, as much as you can, and you need to seek a godly wife. Make sure that you're godly, living godly too, because you don't want to get a godly wife and mess her up. You don't want to get a godly husband and mess him up. You want to start being godly, find a godly wife to avoid fornication. So, marriage is to avoid fornication. And then he says in verse 3 through 5, he says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So he says in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt ye not for your incontinency. So you don't want to defraud one another. You don't want to take away the, uh, the privileges of the marriage bed from each other. Because you know why? Satan can come in and tempt you in this situation. It's like you're keeping that from your husband. Oh, he's going to go to work the next day. All those women flirting with him. Satan's going to start tempting him. Same thing with the wife. Especially with the wife. If you've got a wife in the workforce, uh, she's going to, all the, the dogs are going to be slobbering over her all day long. So you don't want to defraud one another in this matter because Satan's going to tempt you during that time. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now verse 8. Look at 7 and verse 8. He says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. You see, he said, it, you'd be better off to just stay single like me. But if you can't marry, or if you can't, if you can't stop burning in your lust, you need to go ahead and get married to avoid fornication, you see. He says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn. Then you look down at verse 15. He says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. You see, if your spouse departs from you, if they leave you, you're not under bondage in such cases. You're free to remarry and it not be a sin on your part. And that's, I know everybody wants to make it seem like you're the worst person ever, but there's a lot of people that uh, they've had a divorce. Their spouse has left them. They didn't want the divorce. They are not in bondage. They are free to remarry. And then look down at verse 39. You get at verse 39, it says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So if your spouse dies, you're free to remarry, but it has to be obviously a, a saint you, that you're marrying. And this chapter, it's the best chapter on Christian rules on marriage. Anytime you got a crush, question on marriage, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul covers just about all of it. 
You get to chapter 8, Paul's going to talk about meat offered to idols. And like in chapter 8, 4 through 6, it says, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So, me and you, we know that, that the idols are nothing. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. We know that there's no other God but one. You know, Paul knew that that meat sacrificed to an idol, the idol was nothing. I mean, it, it, was, just, it was just silly stuff. He knows that there's just but one God. And he's uh, worshiping the one true God. But he says in verse 7, How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. He says, Not every man, every man knows that like him. He says, For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So you see, you got, Paul had liberty to eat meat, whether it was offered to idols or not. But there were certain people, if they seen him eating meat offered unto idols, their conscience bothered them about doing that. And if they saw Paul eating the meat offered to idols, they would eat it even though their conscience was bothering them about it. And they sin against their conscience by doing that. So, and it's not just eating meat offered to idols. You could apply that to all kinds of things. You know, as, as the liberty that you have in some things, is it going to cause somebody else to stumble? Like some people, some Christians, they're against having a Christmas tree. Um, some of them are not. And if they came in there and they see that, well, you got Christmas trees, you're celebrating Christmas, it just, it's really going to bother them. And you can be a stumbling block to them. Does that mean you shouldn't have all that stuff? No, it just don't, don't just come up to them and just brag about all that stuff in front of them, you see. You get to chapter 9, you got freedom and rights for ministers. Chapter 9, it talks about freedom and rights of Bible-believing ministers. In verse 9, or in chapter 9, verse 4, it says, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? You see, if, if the Lord Jesus Christ had got married like a lot of people say, then he would say, have we not power to lead a brother, a, a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the Lord? No, he didn't say as the Lord. He said, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. So a lot of, a lot of people are going to try to tell you, well, Jesus Christ got married. If Jesus Christ got married, then Paul would have, used Jesus Christ as an example here as someone who got married that took a wife. You see, Paul's saying, you know, I got power to take a wife like the apostles, like Cephas, which is Peter. You know, Peter was married. Contrary to a lot of what a lot of people believe or want to deny, uh, they say that Peter was the first pope. Well, Peter was married. That's not a very good pope then, is it? Because they don't, uh, the popes don't believe that they can get married, you see. So, he says, Are I only in Barnabas? Have we not power to forbear working? You know, he uh, Paul, he, he didn't have to make tents like he did and uh, have a, any type of secular work. He could have just, just taken money from the people that he was ministering to. Because he says in verse 7, Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? 
you know, you pay soldiers or you keep, you'll keep up a soldier for his work. He says, who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? You know, these other jobs, they pay. What Paul was doing, the ministering to the Corinthians, it wasn't paying Paul. He says, say all these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. He says in verse 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes no doubt that it is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So he's, he's saying there, you know, don't muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. You know, don't put something on the ox's mouth to where when he's when he's working, he can't put his head down and get some of the corn to eat, you see. So that's the right of a, a minister there. And that he get you get down, he says, they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But Paul wasn't taking money from the Corinthians. He didn't want to be a stumbling block to him in any way. He thought, you know, well, they'll think I'm just doing this for money. So he didn't charge them. Then in chapter 10, you got examples from the Old Testament. You're going to see examples from the Old Testament. And you're going to see how in verse 6, it says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after either evil things as they also lusted. And he says, Neither be ye idolaters. As were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication of some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand, like in Numbers chapter 25. You see, there's all kinds of Old Testament examples of what to do and what not to do. He says in verse 6, Now these things were our examples. Later on, he calls them in samples. See, you, the, the Old Testament isn't just old news. All those stories back there are for your examples. And that's why Paul's constantly going back and using them as illustrations. And in verses 7 through 11, he's giving you the examples of what not to do. Look what he says, neither be ye idolaters. Verse 8, neither let us tempt Christ. Verse 10, neither murmur ye. He says in verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, and upon the ends of the world are come. So you see, the Old Testament is a valuable thing. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You need both. You get to chapter 11, and that's where you got the... Uh, that's where people get into the head covering stuff, where they want to have head coverings. But it's really about the proper order of authority. The head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not so much about long hair on women and short hair on men and uh, vice versa. It's about are you in rebellion to the proper authority? You know, a lot of times when a guy gets long hair, he's doing it and to be rebellious. A lot of times when a woman gets short hair, she's doing it because she's rebellious to that authority. A lot of lesbians, they just go ahead and just cut their hair off a lot of times. A lot of men, they get that long hair when they're in rebellion. It's not so much about having long hair and short hair. And I don't spend much time about how uh, long somebody's hair is supposed to be you know you know you, you also got to take things into con consideration there's exceptions to it like you got to look at there there's you could be talking about this and this could be a chemo patient you're talking to it could be an elderly person you're talking to that's lost hair it could be you have to take people's different races hair in, into that and think about that too so it's not so much about long hair and short hair. 
it's about are they having that certain length of hair because of its of rebellion things like that now in this day and time as a man especially in this day and time uh, I want to stay looking as like a man as much as I can. I don't want to be there to be some type of blurred lines there to where somebody could think I'm trying to look like a woman, especially not in this day and time. But the, this is the chapter for that where you've got, Paul says, be ye followers of him. He talks about the, the order of authority. And then he you're going to get down where he talks about the Lord's Supper. And this is where, this is why he gives you the reason why we do the Lord's Supper. Verse 26 in chapter 11, he says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So why do you do the Lord's Supper? You're showing the Lord's death till he come. Now the, the bread doesn't literally turn into the flesh of Jesus. The juice doesn't literally turn into the blood of the Lord Jesus. It's just a, a symbol. It's just a picture of it. And he says in verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You see, if you're, at, when you, you know, you've been at church and when they have the Lord's Supper and they'll have you come up to the altar and get things right with God and have you examine yourself. That's why they do it, because this is a time when you need to be examining yourself which you should be doing that every day. But let a man examine himself. Make sure that you're right with the Lord. You know, if you judge yourself, you should not be judged. It's like it says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. You need to have a daily self-judgment. You have to acknowledge that in this flesh, it's not perfect. You have not got your glorified body yet. You're a sinner and you need to examine yourself Judge yourselves, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. You get into chapter 12, you got the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he talks about in verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit's in all of us, and he's got different jobs, different gifts that he's given us, but it's the same Spirit. And it's the same spirit that needs to get, get the credit. You got in uh, verses 12 through 27, how all members, we're all members of the same body, and each member of the body is important. You know, the foot can't say unto the hand, I have no need of you, and vice versa. You know, no part of the body can look at the other part and say that, that they don't need us. Then you got in chapter 13, the charity chapter. Uh, real love towards other Christians. The nature of true Christian love is what you have in chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, you got rules on tongues. And Paul said in 14.1, he said, I would rather you prophesy. You know, you got all the emphasis on tongues, but Paul says he would rather they prophesy. And you see, these aren't. this isn't some uh, heavenly language, some unknown jibber-jabber. Because look what he says in verse 10. He says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. So someone somewhere would understand the tongue. It, like, like I said with, in the, with the Corinthians, it's still going through that transition from Jew to Gentile. So, and there's still unbelieving Jews present. So they, it hasn't completely faded out yet, those, those sign gifts. But if they really had the sign gifts, the voice wouldn't be without signification. It, wouldn't just, it wasn't just some jibber-jabber. It wasn't some heavenly language that nobody speaks. They would have been speaking an actual language that somebody on the earth spoke. And... Paul said in verse 19, he said, I would rather speak five words with my understanding than in the unknown tongue. Look at what he says in verse 19. He said, yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. 
See, it's more important that somebody can understand what you're saying and then they can be edified off of it. And then you get down to the rules for tongues. In verse 27, it says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So if you're going to have people speaking in tongues, it could be two or three. Just two or three. That's not what you're seeing in these tongue-speaking churches. It's a whole bunch. And he says, and that by course, meaning one at a time, not all at once. They're breaking that rule. And he says, let one interpret. If nobody interprets, what's, what's the point? How's it going to edify anybody? He says, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. See, he's not wanting a bunch of people talking at once, and a bunch of people talking at once. It's There's not much edifying there, not much comforting there, because you're not understanding what's going on. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Meaning it's not just going to be just, you're, you just can't control yourself. He says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And you see in verse 22, he even said, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You see, uh, you got in these churches, they're acting like it's, for the people that believe. No, it's for people that believe not. The, the sign gifts were to confirm the word with signs following to the people that didn't believe. You already believe. So why do you think you need tongues so much? And then he goes on to say, let your women keep silence in the churches in verse 34, for it's not permitted unto them to speak. And that's in the context of tongues. So if a woman's not supposed to speak in tongues and you go to a tongue-speaking church, who's doing most of the tongue-speaking? It's women. So they're breaking all these rules on tongues. They're just doing some something that's completely unbiblical. Tongues in the Bible are known languages that are known to somebody in the world, not some type of heavenly jibber-jabber thing. But you get into chapter 15, and this is the resurrection chapter. And the first four to eight verses, Paul goes over the gospel, how that Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and he explains how he was, how the Lord was seen in his resurrection body by over 500 people at once and he explains the importance and surety of the resurrection. Through verses 12 through 19, look what he says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how, so, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? He's saying that our resurrection is so sure that if it doesn't happen, then Jesus Christ isn't even risen. And so he says, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then all this preaching we're doing is in vain and our faith is in vain. If the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised, he said in verse 16. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. You're on your way to hell if the Lord Jesus Christ didn't raise. And if, and if we don't resurrect, then Jesus didn't resurrect. That's how sure Paul was in the resurrection. And then he goes on with the famous verses down in 49 through 58 about the rapture. And how in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, we're going to get our bodies changed. We're, this this mortal is going to put on immortality. The corruption is going to put on incorruption. So read 49 through 58 and get those verses down your mind. Really important verses. Then in chapter 16, you got Paul's future plans and closing. And he talks about what he's got planned. He talks about some of his friends. You know, Paul had friends in the ministry. 
he tells them to, in verse 13, he says, he says, watch ye, stand in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. He's wanting the Corinthians to, to be, be real men, quit being so uh, carnal and fleshy. He says, let all your things be done with charity. He says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So he's, he's trying to, he's telling the Corinthians in chapter 16, his future plans, and he's trying to encourage them. Stand fast, be men, get addicted to the ministry. But that's 1 Corinthians, and I hope it's, hope you get just a, a broader view of what the book of 1 Corinthians is about. It's good to get you get a good review down, uh, overview done in your head before you ever attack the book. And by attack, I mean dig in and and read it and study it and believe it, believe every word of it. <laughs>